Hello everyone, and welcome back to Screenwriter's Pitch. Um, I figured I'd do things a little bit differently this episode for a few reasons. I'm on vacation, so I wanted to take things a bit, <laughs> a bit, you know, more relaxed this time. Um, I've just come out of a cold. I'm, I'm just now getting out of it, um, but it's been with me for like a month. So I really have very little energy right now. So I wanted to try and make this episode a bit easier for me to edit. So I'm doing this uh, in a face cam uh, style. Uh, but hey, I decided to put in a bit of effort. You know, there's the tree and I put on a hat. So come on, don't say I'm not making an effort here. But I've got my script here in front of me. So if I look down, that's what I'm looking at. I've got my microphone in my hand. <laughs> I don't have the time to properly edit this into the screenwriter's pitch style that you know. I'll put in some images and, and things um, so you won't be forced to look at my face this whole time. You gotta understand, it's just like, I'm very, between my cold, between my finals, and between working on a feature length live action film, It's it's been a bit busy for me, so I'm, you, you'll, you'll have to forgive me for uh, doing it in this way. It's Christmas, and in that spirit, I thought I'd uh, give you guys a gift, which is this video. <laughs> Hope you like it. <laughs> Today, I thought I would go back and rewrite uh, Homecoming and Far From Home. Since I did a pre-write for No Way Home, which came out like a week ago, um, I figured, hey, what better time than now to go back and uh, touch upon the films that I haven't really talked about uh, in uh, this trilogy. Um, kind of round things off in a way. Um, so you guys have a complete trilogy um, of this MCU Spider-Man from my perspective. So yeah, I'll also be touching upon uh, Spider-Man's other appearances in Civil War and in the Avengers movies. So I'm going to be doing a whole um, rewrite of that whole thing, but still starting from the same base idea, I'm sort of rewriting, I'm not doing a whole new pitch from scratch. Uh, maybe I'll do that someday, where I'll propose my take on how I would have incorporated Spider-Man in the MCU if it was up to me, but uh, this video is just about rewriting the films as they are, um, and pitching what they might have been. Civil War is a, a good base, I think. Um, I really like the way Spider-Man's incorporated into that story. And I see a lot of people saying, like, what did you expect, you know, Spider-Man to do? Like, there wasn't a, a lot of time for him to have the same kind of arc that he did in the um, comic book Civil War, in which Spider-Man had a pretty extended arc where he's on Team uh, Iron Man, and then he, you know, realizes that he made a mistake and then changes sides and then goes on to Team Cap. Obviously, within Civil War, you know, the, the team that incorporated Spider-Man had, like, weeks to put it together. So, I understand that he didn't have a full arc in that, and that's not really a, my problem. So, that's fine. I think his inclusion in Civil War is great, and in fact, I want to build upon that um, in my approach for uh, Homecoming and Far From Home. Going into Homecoming, the first thing I'd remove is the opening uh, video diary that Peter does. I like it on paper, I, I like the concept of it. Um, I feel like that's very much something a modern Peter Parker would do. But I think the execution of it ends up leaving us with more questions than answers. It even opens up a few, granted, fairly minor inconsistencies, but nevertheless ones that are very easily noticeable. Okay, so the craziest thing just happened, right? I got in a fight with Captain America and I stole his shield and I threw it at him and I'm... Uh, he's big now, I gotta go. Hang on. Holy shit! The most significant um, inconsistency though, and I think this one is quite significant in my opinion, is the moment that ends the sequence with Tony. Um, I really don't understand why Tony is being so jokey and like laughing around and, and whatnot when either that scene takes place after the airport battle in which Tony saw his best friend plummet from the sky and almost lose his life, or alternatively, it is set after the end of Civil War in which Tony lost the fight against Cap 
the Avengers are disbanded and Tony has got to be at one of the lowest points of his life, you know, on an emotional level. I really don't like the fact that he's so, I, I don't buy that he'd be so chipper. It seems a bit of a disconnect uh, in terms of the timeline here. We don't need to know how Tony gave Peter the suit. Like, I think we can just assume Peter kept it after the events of Civil War. I don't really think that it's necessary to see that bit with uh, with Tony. So let's just scrap that whole thing and move on. Instead, I would like to start the film with a flashback to young Peter. Now hold on, relax. I know what you're gonna say, but this is gonna be very different from the opening of Amazing Spider-Man. It's not at all gonna be like that because uh, we're not t we're not going over Peter's parents and any of that. We're just gonna have a nice, pleasant scene uh, between young Peter and Uncle Ben. The two of them are at a lake, and Uncle Ben is trying to teach Peter how to fish. As he does this, Uncle Ben is, you know, teaching Peter the importance of always trying to do the right thing whenever the situation uh, calls for it. Peter asks, you know, how do you know that you're always doing the right thing, right? You know, how, how do you always know that what you are doing is the right thing to do? And, and Ben responds that, well, you don't. You don't always know that what you're doing is the right thing, but it's better to do good, or at least try to do good, and then make a mistake in doing so, than to do nothing and regret not having intervened when you could have. This is going to serve as the sort of thematic backbone of this film, uh, and additionally it'll give some extra context to the moment in Civil War where Peter says, when you can do the things that I can and you don't, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. Which obviously is a sort of great power and great responsibility thing, but it's more importantly going to be the thematic anchor of the film, and I really want to lean in on that. We don't need to do the origin again. We don't need to see Uncle Ben getting shot. We don't need to see Peter bit being bit by the spider, but the weight and significance of those events should be felt, and that's what I want to tap into here. After that point, the first act can remain mostly the same. Uh, everything to do with the vulture and Peter discovering all the intricacies of his new high-tech suit. But what I'd add is a series of small moments that cause Peter to question his allegiance to Stark. It makes perfect sense for Peter to look up to Tony at the start of the film, but as Peter starts to learn more about Tony's past, including what he did to people like the Vulture, he begins to think that he might have made a mistake in joining his side. He reflects, talking to Karen, that Tony kept a lot of information from him. He wasn't given a full picture of the conflict, and in the end he was kind of used by Tony. The fact that Tony has been practically ignoring him for months is, in a way, proof that Tony really doesn't care about Peter as a person and that Tony really just threw Peter to the wayside once he was done using him. Where the biggest change of the film happens is during the ferry scene. After everything happens as it does, Peter tries to, you know, save people, and then the ship splits in half, Tony has to come in and save the day. The change I would make is to the argument that Peter has with Tony after the fight, and this all culminates in this argument. Tony's position is that Peter put people at risk by getting involved, Peter retorts that he couldn't ignore this. When Tony brings up that he had called the police ahead of time, Peter scoffs in disbelief. To Peter, this is proof that all of his concerns were valid. He argues that this is proof that Stark never had any regard for him. As if he did, he probably would have communicated this to Peter rather than just leaving him in the dark. And by God, Peter never says that he would be nothing without the suit. Instead, he says quite the opposite. He's angry in Tony, he yells at him, and he says he can take his stupid suit back, take away all the bells and whistles, and I will still be a better hero than you will ever be. Cap was right about you. Those words send Tony over the edge, not because they're untrue, but because he knows Peter is right. But the wounds are still fresh, and Peter has just dumped a pile of salt directly into them. Peter and Tony battle it out. Tony fights fair at first, but as he's losing the fight, he resorts to hacking Peter's suit, which he controls. He deactivates the web shooters, and 
all other gadgets and closes the lenses, making Peter blind. Peter tries to remove the mask, but Tony codes it so that Peter is shocked if he tries. Peter has to rely only on his spider sense to keep going, but as he is still inexperienced, this isn't enough. Tony gets the upper hand and is beating Peter. He suddenly gets flashbacks to the fight with Cap and realizes what he's become. Without saying a word, he deactivates all power to Peter's suit and flies off. Peter is finally able to remove his mask and takes a deep breath, letting the emotions pass through him. Like in the original film, he returns home and tells May that he lost the Stark internship, but his tears are about the remorse for putting all the other Avengers in prison, something that he's complicit in since he joined Tony's side during the conflict. The tears are not for losing Tony's suit or his affection, it's about the guilt he feels for what he's done. The thing that I wanted to do here was to make this feel more like a true sequel to the events of Civil War, taking some inspiration from the Civil War comic in which Peter initially is lured to Team Stark and then slowly realizing he made the wrong choice and after a fight with Tony, he ends up joining Team Cap. Like I said, there was no time in the movie Civil War for Peter to switch sides, but I nevertheless wanted to adapt this element of the comic. Uh, because in my eyes it doesn't really make sense with how the film Civil War ends for Tony to be painted in such a positive light throughout Homecoming. Sure, throughout the film we get some nods and allusions to the fact that maybe Tony's not such a great guy, but nothing's really ever made of it. Tony never has to really face that himself. And the only real lesson he learns is that he should have trusted Peter more, which is like, well yeah, no shit. Peter and Tony's relationship, as set up by Civil War, I think is a really promising one, but I think that they took it in the wrong direction. I think that Peter's adulation of Stark should have worn off through time and become more of a respect situation rather than, you know, praise and affection in, in the way that it's portrayed throughout the rest of the movies after Civil War. The third act continues the same way it did in the original film, with the only major difference being that Peter doesn't call Happy uh, and simply decides to go after the Vulture of his own accord. During the conversation that Peter has with the Vulture, Peter should acknowledge that Toombs is right, that he agrees with him and that he was wrong to trust Stark. He screwed both of them over in the end, but just because Stark did that doesn't give Toombs the right to do these heists that could put people at risk. Toombs responds that he does all this for his family and asks, why does Peter do what he does? Peter responds, when you can do the things that I can and you don't, and then the bad things happen, they happen because of you. Toombs pauses for a moment before looking Peter in the eye. That's very cute, but I'm afraid the walls are coming down on this one. Vulture collapses the building the same way he does in the film, leaving Peter to have his if this be my destiny moment, a moment that is, in my opinion, strengthened by the journey Peter has just been on, feeling less like an act done out of spite and rather one done because this is just who he is. He is Spider-Man. The rest of the third act will continue the same way it does in the original film with Peter stopping the vulture, uh, saving his life in the process, but instead of it ending with Peter going to the Stark compound, or I guess the Avengers compound, but the Avengers don't exist, whatever, you know what I'm saying. Instead of Peter going there and having a conversation with Tony, Peter returns home to find Tony waiting for him, much as he was in Civil War. The difference is though, this time Peter is not pleased to see Tony, and he asks to speak with him in private. Tony apologizes for what he's done, but Peter says that while he is ready to forgive Tony, he doesn't think he can be a part of the Avengers. In this instance, Peter declines the offer to join the Avengers not because he thinks it's some kind of test, but because he morally cannot justify doing so within the current circumstances. He has organically moved away from that goal and insists that all he wants to be, all he ever needed to be, was a friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. The two part ways amicably. Aunt May asks if he got the Stark internship back, and Peter responds that it just wasn't a good fit for him and that he should go out there and make it on his own. The film ends with Peter hearing a siren and swinging off in classic Spidey fashion.